All right, so in this video, we're going to continue this concept of macromolecules as we look at properties of individual macromolecules. Kind of an overview here, and then in the next video, we'll be looking more at how their structure of the molecule determines their function. This idea of structure and function are very important in biologic, biological systems. If you look here at this mallet, it has a very specific function that is to smash things or to hit things, push them together, whatever it is. You know, this is a joiner's mallet for woodworking, and it is designed to move things, all right? You could use something else. You could use your hand, for instance, but your hand is just not very well made for that because it's soft. You could damage it. In this case, this big block of wood is not soft. It's made out of maple and walnut, two very hard woods, and they don't mind hitting other wood and making it move. And so the structure of this is perfectly aligned with its function. And you see this in biological systems a lot. And then consequently, a change in that structure generally results in a change in its function which is, should make sense to us, right? We, If this hammer didn't have a handle, for instance, you would have to use it completely differently, and you may not even be able to use it to do the same kinds of things. And so you get the way that that works. And so we're going to look at the structure and function of each one of the macromolecules that we list, and we're going to start with nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are composed of individual parts called nucleotides, which we mentioned in the last video, and each nucleotide is composed of three subcomponents, which you see listed here. A five-carbon sugar, sometimes you'll see this called a pentose sugar, that O-S-E is just the suffix typically associated with sugars, and then P-E-N-T is five, so five-carbon sugar is what you see here, and the phosphate group Remember, we talked about how phosphorus is important in the formation of nucleotides. And then a nitrogenous base. Again, nitrogen being very important in the formation of nucleotides as well. The function of nucleic acids is to store biological information. And they do this through a sequence of these nucleotides, not just one by themselves. Individual nucleotides can have functions. We'll talk about a couple of nucleotides that have very important functions like ATP, for instance. But in this case, we're looking at these nucleic acids as a whole being uh, storages for hereditary information like DNA and RNA are examples of this. And so before we talk about proteins, each type of nucleic acid, I mentioned two, DNA and RNA, differs in its five carbon sugar. We'll talk more about this in a future video. And they also can differ in the nitrogenous bases that are available, whereas DNA will have a nitrogenous base called thymine and RNA doesn't have thymine. Instead, it has a, a base called uracil. Again, that will be covered more thoroughly in a future video. And so looking at the function of proteins, the structure and function of proteins, this is an in amino acid. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Proteins have a wide variety of functions. I generally will say in class that proteins do everything. That's not entirely true, obviously, but proteins can act as enzymes. They can act as um, storage units. They can act as transport units. There's a lot of different things that proteins can do. And so We'll talk about some of those functions of individual proteins, but as far as coming up with their individual functions, it's, there's going to be a long list of that. Uh, this protein, or this amino acid, has some specific parts that we'll look at. Amino acids have two ends to them, so they have some directionality to them. There's the amino terminus end, or the N terminus end, and then the carboxyl terminus, or the C terminus end of an amino acid. And each amino acid is going to have these parts on them. And then each amino acid is also going to have what is known as this R group down here. This R is, can stand for any one of 20 different and uh, unique groups of molecules or groups of atoms here that can be just as simple as another H there, or it can be extremely complex. And as you bind these these amino acids together, they will take on a shape. 
and that shape then can determine their function. So this is an example of two amino acids joining together. Remember, we talked about this in the previous video. Here you have the N-terminus and the C-terminus. And so the OH of the C-terminus combines with the H of the N-terminus. Pull that water out, you combine, and that forms this covalent bond known as a peptide bond. In our bodies, there are 20 occurring, 20 naturally occurring amino acids, and each one of them has some different properties, and they're typically divided into a few groups. And you can see that here. You're not going to need to know these individual R groups. That would be a, a chore. But you can see these are all known as nonpolar amino acids because of the way that their R groups work. You can see here there's a bunch of nonpolar units added on to those, and since these amino acids don't have any polarity, they're going to react a certain way, right? Well, the same with these. These amino acids do have some polarity. Here you see these oxygens here, which add that polarity. There's a sulfur, these nitrogens, big molecules that attract a lot of electrons. And so these are going to have some polarity to them or some unequal sharing of electrons, which is going to have the slight positive, slight negative. And so there's going to be some different attractions there, particularly when water is in mind and think about this with nonpolar how are they going to combine together nonpolar doesn't want to see water polar absolutely wants to see it and then you have some amino acids that have a charge to them they ionize some of them lose their hydrogens in solution forming an acids and some of them pick up hydrogens forming a base and so depending on the type of amino acid it's going to react differently and they're going to react differently with each other as they bind together and this is going to cause a protein to form a very specific shape and that specific shape is for its specific function again the number of proteins is in the hundreds of thousands and so and each one of them have a specific function we will talk about a few of them in this class but the idea here is that again just like with the nucleotides shape determines function here's with carbohydrates carbohydrates is a little less complex than the, what we have been talking about but as you can see here this is or these are three different carbohydrates all of them have the same chemical formula c6 h12 o6 but they are all shaped differently notice here in the glucose and galactose it's just the change of this OH being different. And here in fructose, the double bonded oxygen is located in the middle of the molecule as opposed to on the end. And so this causes these molecules to react differently. They have completely different chemical properties because of their different shapes. This word isomer just means shapes of chemicals. And lastly, with lipids, lipids are the same way. Now, lipids are all nonpolar as a rule, and they are composed of these units called fatty acids. We looked at that in a previous video, and they are combined together by this molecule called a glycerol. And these fatty acid chains here can be saturated or unsaturated, and this will completely determine the way that they react. Notice this saturated is a nice orderly looking lines. And so when they get together, they can stay nice and orderly. And so when something stays nice and orderly, it doesn't move around a lot. And so saturated fats tend to be solids at room temperature. Whereas unsaturated fats, notice you have, let me move me out of the way here. Notice you have this double bonded carbon right here. and you could put some more hydrogens in here. And so what causes this, this double bond causes this molecule to bend. Well, you can't put as many bent things in a box as you can non-bent things. And so unsaturated fats tend to be liquids at room temperature. There are some exceptions to these rules, but in general, those rules pretty much stand. And so again, it completely changes the way that these molecules react in a system. Another type of lipid that is important to our studies are called phospholipids. And phospholipids are found on cell membranes. And here, notice phospholipids have a hydrophilic section. That means that they love water because hydrophilic means water loving. And that means that they are a polar section. And then they have a hydrophobic section, which means water fearing. And what's interesting about 
this hydrophobic tail is it has a saturated fat and an unsaturated fat on it. And so this is an example of a very important lipid because these phospholipids make up our cell membranes. And because they have a hydrophilic region and a hydrophobic region, they tend to react interesting when you put them in water. So you think of this as a cell membrane here. The outside of the cell has water in it, or water. The inside of the cell has water. And notice the water-loving sections of those phospholipids are facing out toward the water. And this, the water fearing face toward each other. And so this creates a nice barrier between the cell, the inside of the cell, and the outside world. This is known as a phospholipid, because there's phospholipids in it, bilayer, because there's two of them. And all of our cell membranes, including the organelles in them, have this type of phospholipid bilayer. 